Hey, we're following the general plan that everything you measure in statistics needs to have a standard error attached to it because everything you measure might be wrong and you need to know how much it might be wrong. We're going to do two more examples, one equal to the previous example and another example of poverty rates so that we can review standard errors for proportions. And then we're going to put them together to talk about the standard error for a difference of two proportions. Everything we say about a standard error for a difference of two proportions will also apply to a standard error for a difference of two means. So let's review our New York example. We have poverty rates in New York and now, late, and now also in Pennsylvania. We have 150 out of 1,000 surveyed are living in poverty. That produces a probability, a, a proportion, which is a sample proportion of 15%. The standard error for a proportion does not follow the formula sigma over the square root of n. It follows the formula p times 1 minus p over n square root. And that, when we plug in uh, 0.15 for p and 1,000 for n, gives us 0.0113, or 1.13%. The confidence interval that we can make out of that is 15% plus or minus double this value, which is a confidence interval from 12.74% to 17.26%, which essentially means that from this information, 150 out of 1,000 surveyed, we can confidently conclude that out of the many millions of people in New York, somewhere between 12.74 and 17.26% of them are in poverty. That's, our, that's our, our confident conclusion here, and our level of confidence in that conclusion is 95%. If we're sort of 5% willing to possibly be wrong, then this is an appropriate level uh, for us to report. Now, I'm going to repeat this example for different numbers in Pennsylvania, just in order to show how that works. And then we're going to start putting these things together. So let's imagine hypothetically that also that in Pennsylvania, we also measured 1,000. We sampled 1,000 people, and we got 110 um, who reported living in poverty. So that's 11. That's 0 0.11, which is 11%. And that 0 0.11 is the value of P that can be plugged into the formula for the standard error for that proportion. And when we plug this in, we'll get 0 0.0099. That's just, just shy of 1%. So just about 1% there. Then uh, the confidence interval is going to be 11% plus or minus just about 2%. And that'll give us a confidence interval that goes, that stretches from 9% to 13%, more or less, 9.02 to 12.97. Now, when you look at this data, um, especially you know, this example for New York put together with this example for Pennsylvania, then it's tempting to draw conclusions that compare the two states. And the obvious conclusion to draw here, if you're comparing the two states, is more people in New York are living in poverty than in Pennsylvania. So is it safe to deduce? Is it safe to conclude here that New York has more people in poverty well, let me say not more people in poverty, but has a greater poverty rate. Because I'm not reasoning about the total populations here. I'm just reasoning about the rate of poverty. Is it, is it safe to conclude that New York has a greater poverty rate than Pennsylvania? Now, from a, from a certain, per, there are three answers to this, depending on how hard you think about it. If you think just a little bit hard, then you'll recognize that New York has 15% in poverty and Pennsylvania has 11% in poverty. And 15 is more than 11, so done and done, right? New York has more people in poverty. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a sample proportion and it's not equal to the true proportion of New Yorkers who are in poverty. We, this is not exactly the right proportion to be using here. The right proportion is with the thing that we don't see, the thing that we're trying to describe by the confidence interval. And so we don't know that this 15% is the truth of the matter that applies generally to New York, to everyone in New York. That's the whole point of bothering to produce the confidence interval to predict that general proportion. And similarly, we don't know that 11% applies to everybody in Pennsylvania. So the 15 is greater than the 11, sure, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the population, that the poverty rate in New York is greater than that in Pennsylvania. But let's look to the confidence intervals. This confidence interval stretches from 12.74 to 17.26. And this one has much smaller numbers. It stretches from 9, which is a lot less than 12, to 12, which is a lot less than 17. And so both of these numbers are bigger than both of these numbers. So again, it seems 
the poverty rate is greater in New York, right? So these numbers are bigger than these numbers, and these tell the poverty rate in New York, and these tell the poverty rate in New York. And so again, it seems, well, in Pennsylvania, so again, it seems the poverty rate in New York is higher. And again, it seems like this is a slam dunk, but it's not. Because these numbers describe our uncertainty about the poverty rate in New York. The true poverty rate is somewhere in between here. And I'm willing to say with confidence that it's somewhere in between here, but I'm not willing to say that I'm sure that it's 16 or sure that it's 13 or I, you know, I hope it's on the low end here, of course, because, because we hope it would be lower, but I don't know and I'm not willing to say for sure that it's, that it's anywhere in particular. These numbers reflect our uncertainty about the poverty rate in New York. And these numbers reflect our uncertainty about the true poverty rate in Pennsylvania. And so the real comparison here, the interesting comparison here to the question, is the poverty rate in New York greater than that in Pennsylvania, is the comparison between these numbers. Because this number is our lower threshold for how low the poverty rate in New York might be. And this is our upper threshold for how high the poverty rate in Pennsylvania might be. And this number is higher than that. Think about the possible answer 12.8. Maybe the poverty rate in New York is 12.8. That's consistent with our, with our uh, confidence interval here because 12.8 is greater than 12.74. Maybe the poverty rate in Pennsylvania is 12.82 because that's consistent with our poverty rate or maybe even 12.9. So the fact that there are some numbers like 12.9 that lie in this interval and there are some numbers like 12.8 that lie in this interval and 12.9 could be bigger than 12.8, right? So that could mean that there are possible values of the poverty rate in Pennsylvania that exceed those of New York. And so it seems that we're uncertain. This level of uncertainty and this level of uncertainty combined to give us a kind of a double uncertainty. And so um, from this point of view, we cannot say definitively that the poverty rate in New York is greater than that in Pennsylvania, even from this information. So um, however, this is really challenging because it's unlikely that we're wrong so much in this direction for our New York measure and also wrong so much in the coincidentally backwards direction for the Pennsylvania measure. So really it is possible that we are significantly wrong in our measures, but it's really quite unlikely that we are coincidentally wrong this way in that measure and so much wrong that way in the other measure. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to think about how much we might be wrong, not about the poverty rate of New York, not about the poverty rate of Pennsylvania, but about the difference between them, which is the key question here. So let's consider the measure, which is P for New York minus P for Pennsylvania, the difference between the two proportions. Now, our question, does New York have a higher poverty rate, is basically the question, is that a positive number? Is the difference, the, the poverty rate for New York minus that of Pennsylvania, is that a positive number? If that's positive, then New York has a higher poverty rate. If it's negative, then Pennsylvania has a higher poverty rate. Can we predict anything about the difference? Well, we have a measured value for it. We have a statistical measurement for it that comes from just this work, right? Um, so we already have a statistical measure, and it is 15% uh, minus 11%, which is 4%. So does that mean the poverty rate in New York is higher? No, that's just our measure of it. But we don't know that the measure is completely right. We don't know that that's the truth of the matter. So what we have to do is we have to take that measure and we have to reason about the possibility of the error in that measure. You see, this is a combined measurement. We've measured one thing, we've measured the other thing. One thing is subject to its error. The other thing is subject to its error. And we need to somehow combine that into a combined error to analyze how much error are we likely to see in the difference between these two things. So when you can measure one thing with its error and when you can measure another thing with its error, how do you take these two measures and combine them and figure out the error for the combination? And so uh, what we need is a formula for combining the standard errors. So what we need is a standard error combination formula. 
And what we'll do is we'll put the two standard errors into it and get some overall standard error. So what should the formula be? Well, um, you would expect that the standard error for the difference might be the standard error for the New York, maybe minus the standard error for the Pennsylvania. But that can't possibly be right because our error in the Pennsylvania can't make us more precise about the measurement of the difference. You might likewise expect that it would be the sum of these two things, right? We've got some error for this and we've got some error for this. Maybe we add them together and that tells us how much the error there is there. Actually, it's more complicated than that. The, the correct formula for the standard error of the difference of two measures is the square root of the sum of the squares of the standard error of each measure. So in other words, if you're taking two different measures and trying to measure the difference between them, or even two different measures and trying to measure the sum of them, and this one has error and this one has error, those errors have to get combined into some overall error for the difference or for the sum. And the combining rule that we use is the square root of the sum of the squares, which is a weird formula to use, but it should be a familiar formula from a different context. This is basically the Pythagorean theorem coming in here. And I can't explain the geometry of why that's the Pythagorean theorem at this point, but there is a sort of a pseudo geometric reason why the Pythagorean theorem actually kind of makes sense. Uh, I just, I'm not gonna go into the details. So this is the formula that we will use to measure the standard error of the combined measure here. So let's plug in the numbers and see what this will get us. This tells us that the standard error for the difference, this guy, the standard error for that is equal to the square root of the first standard error, 0.0113 squared, plus the second standard error, 0.0099 squared. And if we work out what that is, we get 0.15. Now we have a measurement um, of the, uh, that's, that can't be right. Um, 0 0.015, sorry, because it was too big. So notice that this is a value which is comparable to this standard error and comparable to this standard error, but slightly larger than both of them. Now that's about one and a half percent, right? And on the basis of this standard error, we can make a confidence interval too, but what could we make a confidence interval for? That's the standard error for the difference. We can make a confidence er interval to predict the truth about the difference. Using our measured value of the difference and our standard error for the difference, we can make a confidence interval for the true difference. So the confidence interval for the difference is going to be the measured value of the difference, which is 4%, plus or minus, don't forget to double the standard error, 3%. So plus or minus 3%. And that is the confidence interval from 1% to 7%. So to recap what we've done, we've taken the standard error for the difference by combining the two standard errors, and the measured value of the difference by subtracting the two, the two measurements, and we've produced a confidence interval for the difference using our measured value, plus or minus, don't forget to double it, this plus or minus double the standard error. And that gives us this confidence interval for the difference. And what on earth does that mean? That means, so in practical terms, this is, because we've doubled the standard error, this is a 95% confidence interval. So, with confidence, we can say the true difference out there among the whole population, the true difference between the true poverty rate in New York minus the true poverty rate in Pennsylvania is somewhere in the range 1% to 7%. I don't know where, but somewhere in that range. And I can say that with a level of confidence, 95% confidence, which is pretty good. Notice here that zero is not in that range, that that range consists entirely of positive values. And that means that we are saying with confidence that the poverty rate in New York minus the poverty rate in Pennsylvania is a positive number, not a negative number. And that, that reflects a certain confidence that yes, indeed, we can say 
with this 95% level of confidence that the poverty rate in New York is higher than that in Pennsylvania. So we can conclude as a sort of a side effect here that we do actually have enough information to deduce that the poverty rate in New York is higher than that in Pennsylvania. These confidence intervals do overlap, but it's so extremely unlikely that the poverty rate in New York is, is, is wrong in the, in the sense of being lower than our measurement and the poverty rate of Pennsylvania is much higher than our measurement. That's so extremely unlikely that it gets eliminated when you do a good analysis of the difference. The analysis of the difference shows us that the difference is definitely, well, is with 95% confidence, somewhere in between the range 1% to 7%. So it might be as high as 7% worse in New York, and it might be as equal as merely 1% worse in New York, but it is definitely higher in New York than Pennsylvania. So it all hinges on our ability to use this formula to combine standard errors uh, into a standard error for a difference. Now in the next example we'll see, we're gonna do a standard error for a difference not of two proportions, but a standard error for a difference of two means. And we'll see that the exact same formula saves the day for us and allows us to make a confidence interval for the difference of two means.